everyone. Thanks for coming to this session. Uh, today we'll be talking about camel design patterns and new cases I've seen around. Uh, before we start, I just want to find out how many of you have used camel in this month. Okay. So the session will be basically about camel and camel use cases. Mm -hmm. I'm a warehouse tech with Red Hat, and as part of my job, I work at the customer side and help customers basically use Camel. And I've seen multiple uh, use cases with Camel, and I put some of those in Camel Design Patterns Book, and the idea today is to share uh, some of those with you. Mm -hmm. I'm also touch Camel computer, so I contributed some of the connectors, some of the Amazon connectors, some of the caching connectors like Redis and Finispan. Recently did some work on the Hystrix integration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. First I just wanted to give you also a little bit of uh, like an update about the project status. Uh, these are statistics from the last uh, quarter. Uh, at the moment Camel has 52 commenters, more than 900 users on the user list. We exchange around, I would say, 1,700 emails per quarter, so quite active community. And a week ago, we had our 1,000 pull requests on GitHub. So these are pull requests from non camel committers. And you can also see uh, the code base has been increasing steadily from the very beginning of 2007 when the project was created. Now it's reaching to minimize the flow. I also remember yesterday someone asking Klaus or Christian about comparing Spring integration and Camel. I think if you're interested from that, you should check the uh, Open Health website where you can find all open source projects and you can do comparison and see all kinds of statistics there. Uh, one of the reasons I think why Camel is getting popular uh, is because it doesn't uh, imply any kind of JVM stuff. So you can use Camel with uh, Wildfly, with Comcast, with Spring Boot, or, or even static void main. So it do doesn't imply any kind of JVM stuff. You can use it the, the way you want. Um, I've seen also use cases where Camel is used uh, or without any routing or enterprise integration pattern. For example, if you have an application a web-based application and you want to put some content on Amazon S3, you can use just the connector to, to send the files to Amazon without any routing or enterprise integration patterns. It's being used with all kinds of architectural styles, but it's quite popular with solar and microservices. And I see even the team now experimenting with serverless architectures, so I would say there are plenty of reasons to use Canon. Let's say you have decided to use Camel and just want to say what are kind of things you should know before doing that. Like uh, as a must read is the enterprise integration patterns, what you see on the left. Even if you don't have the book, just knowing the patterns, so the icons, what they mean, do help to, to discuss integrations in the team. So having a ubiquitous language and say, what is a filter, what is a content-based rubric, you know, this uh, uh, terminology, it really helps. Uh, but on top of that, you have to know things like, uh, at the top you can see signs that represent monolithic SOAR and microservices. So if you are doing SOAR, you have to know SOAR principles. If you are doing microservices, microservices principles. And nowadays, you also have to know resiliency principles, that is things like circuit breaker, both editing stuff from the release. <coughs> and of course, all, all these patterns and use cases, when you implement in Camel, you have to know uh, the, the Camel framework itself. And that's basically the Camel in Action book, I would say, you have here. So after the Camel in Action and Camel Cookbook. Now, when you start to create a camel route, it's good to start with the happy path scenario, so rather than focusing on any kind of uh, error conditions, failure scenario, just focusing on, on the happy paths. And that in camel is, what the whole camel framework is based on pipes and filter, uh, filters pattern. The idea of five, uh, pipes and filters is you split a complex processing 
flow into smaller granular steps which are connected by pipes and if you look at the typical channel route it basically represents uh, the pipes and filters pattern but, but even then there is a question of how do I organize my uh, 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 my flow, the camel route yeah. and a good starting point, a good acronym to keep in mind is METRO METRO stands for Validate, Enrich, Transform, Route and Operate and this is more or less, what is the typical flow of a camera route? Maybe in your case, some of the steps uh, you might not need it, or maybe you have to do validation because the data is coming from some kind of trusted source. But, but more or less, most of the flow follows this pattern. Mm, wonderful is familiar with this science. You see that, yeah, like this, this. can everyone? Understand those? No? Okay. Mm. These are the enterprise integration patterns. Yeah, I use here to just to demonstrate the, the different elements, like the validate step. Usually, mm, in the validate step, you validate the incoming data, and the type of validation depends on the format of the data. If it is an XML data, let's say there are XML uh, validators based on XML schemas. If it is a Java B, there is a Java validator based on you know, Java JSR and Hibernate implementation validator. So there are all kinds of components and patterns that can be used for the validation. The enrich step, the second step here, mm -hmm. is typically used to enrich the incoming data with more context. Not always the incoming request has enough information to uh, that, that is enough for the, for the next step, like transforming and routing. So in the enrich step, you can either use uh, patterns like the enrich and all enrich, or you can simply have a bin that talks to database and loads some more data. And the transform step is required if you if you want to transform the data to a format that is uh, that is easier to work with in the next step. The routing step is where you have things like content-based router. So if the data has this kind of field, go to this route, otherwise go to the other one. And the operate step is, this is where the actual the business logic or the integration point of the route is. Everything else is preparing the data and in the operate state. Typically <coughs> for integration application, you just talk to uh, some, some other systems. Okay, now, now I want to talk about the next pattern, um, which is called edge component. This is another, uh, Example of camel route where we have a file consumer, so we read from a folder files. We have we do some kind of validation. Maybe we ignore some of the files which are not interested. Transformation. Let's say we transform uh, a file into Java bean and some kind of business logic. Maybe we do some calculations and copy the file somewhere else. Now, as you can see here, I've tried to demonstrate how. It is possible sometimes to have information from the edges here to link into your business layer. I mean, uh, this file consumer, when it consumes a file, it populates the message with the exchange with all kinds of useful metadata like the file path and the location, etc. And it is possible to, that you use that information into in, in your business uh, layer. And sometimes you are asked basically to extend uh, an existing service with newer endpoints. Maybe now you have a requirement to add some kind of web service or REST point, uh, REST based endpoint to the same business logic. Yeah, so you still want to use the existing file based polling, but also you want to add some kind of web service endpoint. And if you have this leakage of information that is endpoint specific, you cannot reuse the business logic to one in the other and you basically have to copy and paste the business logic and, uh, and then add the new endpoint. The, the solution for this is basically to apply a single responsibility principle, I would say, from the object-oriented world. Uh, you split your edges here. Yeah. The file-based logic into its own camel route, the web service-based logic into your own route, and you connect them to the business logic. Yeah, it's quite simple with common sense, but sometimes when you start with just endpoints, uh, you, don't, you don't have reason to split, but uh, if you just look a little bit for the uh, you may find some reason. The next one I want to talk about is about read and write services. 
<clears throat> Sometimes you start with uh, maybe with the you keep it simple. Yeah, you have maybe you just have to create some kind of cross application. You, you have a table and you you want to provide uh, some kind of REST endpoint, and it's quite easy with nowadays with libraries like Hibernate to generate your data model, and then you can generate your REST interfaces. But with time, in some cases, the requirements for read and write operations to change. Like for read operations, maybe the UI is getting more complex, and you have uh, now to provide some kind of a dashboard. So the read operations have to do joins in a couple of tables. Maybe now the read operations have to be more performance, so you have to introduce some caching. So even if the, the data model the application has started as one, with time you realize the read and write operations start getting different kind of requirements and they have to uh, evolve separately. And in this case, we'll, we'll, what you can do is use something called, in object oriented world, it's called command query separations. The idea is in object oriented world is you have objects which have just methods with which are just doing read, so query. They, they accept parameters and return data and you have uh, methods which basically mutate the state of the object. Yeah, they don't return data, but just the When you apply this principle at architectural level, uh, what you get back is CQRS, and that, that's another fancy name for <coughs> separating read and write operations. And here you can see, we have split the data model into two. Uh, up we have uh, our query service, so it's not just a data model, but you split basically from one service, you split those into two and you totally decouple them. Then you could apply caching for the querying part. For the right part, you can have other requirements, like you may maybe have to perform some kind of uh, role-based access control, some kind of other checks, or maybe it has to be transactional. Yeah. yeah. You are, you are saying about the rollback? Yeah. Uh, rollback? You are meaning? What, 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 what you mean? No, no, I'll cover rollbacks and transactions in the future, uh, in the next slides. Yeah. But here, sure. still there is no rollback. The idea is, you, rather than starting with one service, you split from the very beginning into separate services on source control level, so you can release, pack, uh, everything then. Uh, in isolation, you use separate projects at NATO level. Basically, you have separate read and write. Uh, services, even though it, if you look at the uh, through microservices, they have one bounded complex, one model. <coughs> you may have to split those. And these were just some examples of happy path scenarios. Uh, the in happy path scenarios are, say, more complex, and the models look like this. Yeah, if you have to catch different kind of errors, with drawbacks, etc it gets really more complicated and we'll see now some of the patterns that are used for the happy path. Mm -hmm. The first principle I want to introduce you to is called data integrity. And <coughs> just to give you an example, let, let's say we have two folders here, yeah, a source folder and a destination folder, and we want to write a very simple application that copies files from source to destination, yeah, that, that's all, and perform some kind of logging. Um, we also have some external application that writes file to source yeah, and some other applications <coughs> which reads from the destination folder. I would say using files is still the most common way for integrating applications. And what are the things you have to consider even for this very simple example? But the very first thing is uh, how do we make sure that this file consumer is not picking up files that are still being written. Yeah? You don't want to read a half an XML file, maybe this process is still writing the file there. Yeah? And for that, the file consumer in Camel provides a number of read log strategies. Yeah, the very first one will, the, the default one will check whether it can get a, a lock on this file. If it can get a lock file, it assumes no one else is writing. But that is not possible in all kind of file system. Maybe you have some kind of shared file system yeah, where read logs are not available. In that case, file consumer can use other strategies like it can try to rename the file. If it can rename, it assumes no one else is writing. Yeah, or 
or another strategy is to use the size, to check the size of the file. Camel can check for a short interval the size of the file. If the size is not changing, it means no one is writing to it, yet, then it would read the file. And there are also other strategies with, with additional files. And you, you need to have similar um, considerations when you are writing the file. How do you make sure that the file you are writing here uh, is not picked up by the external process? And again, Mm, here are different ways to ensure that. The very common one is to use uh, a different file. So rather than writing the file to the destination folder, you can write it to a temporary location or you can write it with a name that is not expected by this uh, process. And at the end, perform just a move, which is an atomic operation. Yeah. If you perform a move, this file uh, read the process, we will see the whole file. It never, there is no chance for it to see half of the file or something. <coughs> Another thing to consider here is the file size. If the file is too large, you don't want to load the whole file in memory before copying. You might make you want to stream it. So then you can enable streaming in Camel. Yeah. And when you do streaming, you have to make sure that you are not reading the stream by accident. If you lock the stream, you can read the stream only once. So you will end up with empty files in the destination folder. There yeah, so a number of things to consider uh, to ensure some kind of data integrity when you are dealing with different kind of endpoints. File, um, file component is just an example of an endpoint that doesn't support transactions or transaction managers. If we have uh, transactions, maybe we are dealing with a queue as in the first example. In this example, we read a message from a queue, have some kind of filtering transformations and we write to a queue there. If we assume that both queues are in the same message broker, it means we can use um, a local transaction because we have only one resource and that, that is the simplest case. The transaction manager will make sure that the message is either in the source queue or in the target or in the deal queue, but there is no way to have any kind of a message loss there. Uh, slightly more complicated scenario is the global transaction uh, case with the global transaction manager. In that case, you, we are dealing with two data sources. We have a queue, but we also have a database. The typical scenario is you have to consume from a queue right to a database, and in this case, maybe from the date get an idea from a database, then you write it to another queue. Yeah. And you have to use a global transaction manager that can coordinate all these uh, resources. Okay. Now, the next one we'll look at is Saga, but the term Saga is used for different purposes. Like uh, the .NET service bus is using it for to <coughs> to demonstrate something else. I think it's also used with domain-driven design when the boundary contexts are talking to each other. The, the term saga used here um, to describe something that when it was originally coined to describe basically um, compensating transactions. So that, that is the name that is uh, more familiar with. In this example, we have, we have one service, which is a travel booking service and this service has to talk to three other services there. Yeah. Whenever it gets a request to book a trip, it has to book a, what is that? It has to book a flight, a car, and a hotel. And that's the requirement. You either book all three or you book none. There is no point to book two of those or one of those. Yeah. And to, to deal with these kind of scenarios, what you have to do is implement the compensating transaction logic. If you follow here the numbers, you'll see that uh, the first request to service one succeeded, and it's great. Then the second one to service two again was successful, but the third one, it failed. Yeah? And in that case, what we have to do is basically compensate or kind of roll back the previous operations in service one and service two. That also means these external services have to provide two kinds of operations. One to perform the actual actions, and one to roll back if you have to roll back to the operation. Uh, this approach with compensating transactions avoids the need for things like a distributed transaction. If you use web services, you could use web service atomic, and which is yes, supported by things like uh, EAP, and you could have some kind of 
uh, global transaction, but that would be pretty uh, slow. This is like, a, uh, I would say, quite the equivalent of that. But maybe the thing to be aware is that this is not exactly this limited transaction because it is possible that this rollback operation fails. Yeah? If that fails, you still will end up <coughs> service one being uh, in an inconsistent state. So you have to find a way to maybe unlock that request somewhere and retry later. It also means these operations have to be as important if you want to retry later. Uh, there shouldn't be any side effect if you are retrying a couple of times to compensate an operation. The, the next one that is very often used is the retry. Mm. The idea is mm, sometimes well, when you do when you call a server service, it's possible that you don't get back any response. Yeah, you you do request and and maybe the you get back response timeout and you don't know whether you, the call was successful or not. And the very natural thing to do in that case is just to retry the operation. Mm. But before doing that, you have to decide which failures to retry. Yeah? For example, if you get connection timeout, response timeout, some of these um, errors common to HTTP, you, you should retry. But maybe you are getting back on a business exception. Yeah? Maybe your request is invalid. In that case, there is no point in retrying because you, if the, your request is invalid, it will be fail. Uh, uh, no matter how many retries you do. Another example is with writing to a database. If you're writing to a database and you get concurrent notification exception, yeah, the chances are if you retry, you will succeed because there was a one-time locking issue there. But if you're getting wrong username and password, there is no point in retry. So with Camel, you have to pick well, what exceptions you want to retry and don't retry all of them. And then you have to decide how many times and how often to uh, retry. If you retry too many times, you may totally kill the other <coughs> service. Maybe it's overloaded and you are just retrying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or if there is too much delay in your retry, it means the SLA or, or the response time of your service will increase drastically. Um, so then the other consideration is the operation you are retrying has to be important. Yeah? You don't want to create some kind of, uh, have any kind of side effect in the other service with each retry. It should be safe to retry. And you have to also monitor <coughs> your applications and detect retries because it is possible that the retries are totally invisible and your operations are succeeding only after some retries. Yeah? You want to be aware of the retries. Mm, that, that was just a theory. Now, the question is how do you retry this with Camel? And there are multiple ways to do that. Okay. The very common one is to do the retry with the Camel error handling. Here again, I have a route that consumes from a queue or I store database, some kind of message store. And then here we have an endpoint. Maybe it's a web service call to external send service yeah, that, that is fake. Yeah. And if you use Camel error handling, uh, Camel error handler will detect the failure here yeah, and will retry uh, that operation for you. And this kind of error handling, you see, it retries only this failing endpoint. So it will not retry the whole Camel root or anything. It will just retry this endpoint. And that, that is usually what you want. Uh, but that retry is fully in memory. So it leaves only in this JVM. And by default, it's also thread blocking. Yeah, it's not asynchronous. So it will block the current thread. Maybe you put the three retries with 30 second delay, so it will block that thread maybe up to a minute and a half. Yeah, you, you can make it asynchronous when, in which case it will put the request to thread pool, etc. But the point is it's all in memory. And this option is good if you want to do maybe quick retries. Yeah, in a matter of milliseconds, I would say, rather than seconds or minutes. Yeah, you want to do just quick retries, two, three retries, just to maybe detect a database log or an HTTP uh, connection problem. Another way to do retry is specific for the messaging endpoint. Uh, if we consume a message from a queue, the message consumers also support retries. Yeah, for example, if you consume a message from ActiveMQ, the consumer will also do retry. So once the message reaches this phase, if it fails, the error will propagate back 
and the consumer will basically process the message again. Uh, in this case, you can see that what we'll end up is we'll end up writing twice the message to a database if we are not scrolling back. You know? So it is possible to have some kind of side effects here. Maybe we are writing to a file system and with each we try we'll end up with, you know, with a file or in this so this is also in memory, yeah, and it also consumes a thread from the consumer. Uh, I would say this one is not that popular, it's not used that much, but by default it's enabled, and by default the ActiveMQ consumer will do three retries for five to make sure the number. Mm. Another kind of retry I had to do at the customer is like a long delayed persistent retry. And in this case, if um, your message reaches again a failing endpoint, what you do is you can put that message to ActiveMQ and set some kind of header. I mean, um, ActiveMQ uh, allows you to send a message uh, to it and put some delay. When you put a delay on the message header, the message is stored in the queue, but it is not <coughs> visible to the consumer. So it, it stays there for maybe a couple of minutes, and you can consume it later and retry it. The advantages here are that the message is stored in the uh, message broker, so it's not lost, even if the JVM restarts, that's fine. Uh, you will get uh, things like uh, load balancing, competing consumers, uh, maybe the message will be consumed by another route, so all the ben benefits of messaging. This is good when you have to do really long delayed retries. There in our case, we have to do, do retry after 15 minutes. In that case, it's best if you put the message back with some uh, delayed header. Some of the more uh, newer patterns. So, Kernel has started as an implementation of enterprise integration patterns book, yeah, and it implements really all the patterns from that book. But that book is 10 years old now, and Kernel is getting also new patterns. So, it's not just implementation of that book, it's all, it also has the new model patterns like the circuit breaker pattern, which was originally published in this book. Um, and this pattern is inspired by uh, real-world circuit breakers. Yeah, this is an example of circuit breaker that protects the electrical system from overloading. And the software circuit breaker pattern is again based on the same principle. And the idea is initially, um, if your service wants to reach one other service, or if there is any kind of uh, unreliable operation, you can use a circuit breaker, and when the circuit breaker is in open state, it won't do anything. Yeah, it will just let the request go to the other system. But if the other system, for some reason, gets slow and stops failing, then you want to protect <coughs> your service. You don't want your service to also become slow because the other service is taking too much risk for them. And this is where the circuit breaker moves to an open state. As you see, in open state, it doesn't let any request go to, to the other service. When our request reaches here, it returns back either some kind of, a, uh, I would say it returns failure, yeah? So it's, it fails straight away without even trying the other endpoint. And the idea is you give some time to the other service to recover, to breathe, and you also protect your services, uh, your service if the other one is uh, taking too long. It stays in this state up to a uh, period, and in that period, you know, after that, um, it moves to half open state. The idea of half open state is the next request at half open state will, will will decide whether the circuit breaker goes back to closed state so everything is back to normal or it remains in open state and continues rejecting. Mm. Yeah, these are the three possible states. And now with version 218, Camel also supports Hystrix. Hystrix is the most popular circuit breaker implementation in Java. Uh, and here you can also see the Hystrix dashboard. So using the Hystrix dashboard, you can see the state of different uh, circuit breakers. Just to give you kind of a feel uh, how the two implementation works. So it is like the old implementation in Camel, which supports only two operations. Uh, the threshold after how many errors failures, the circuit breaker should move to an open state, and the timeout in milliseconds. 
after which the set of record will only for half of our stay. Mm. The district-based based implementation you can see is mm, part of ESL. And here actually you can see only two options, but the district-based one has is supporting almost all options from the library. So there are like 30 possible configurations you can do to, to the district-based implementation. Whereas the other one I have is supports only this two. In this example, if you see if this endpoint fails, it will go to the uh, on fallback, but on fallback is on fallback via network, which means this operation is also not safe. So this operation will be also protected by a circuit breaker. Yeah. The other option is just to use on fallback, which won't be protected, in which case you can't return some kind of default value. Okay, one more. Mm -hmm. Next one is Bulkhead. It is again coming from the release it book. And the idea of this pattern is basically to implement the failure uh, or the uh, damage uh, containment um, principle. And it is again inspired by Bulkhead's in the ships. Mm -hmm. Bulkhead's in the ship basically split the ship into smaller compartments and the idea is that if one of the compartments get damaged the water is not spread in the whole ship but this is a picture from Titanic and it seems the bulkheads there were not high enough and the water was spreading on top of the bulkheads yeah. in the ideal situation you want the water to stay and the way this principle is applied in software system fees Mm, you basically split your application into different components and if one of those fails, you want to protect the other bits. Just on how much time we have, hang on. Is the people outside? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay. So we have time. Mm, and how, how can we do that? So Now, if you think about bulk heading, mm, there, there are multiple levels where you can apply the bulk heading. Uh, the, the very first one is, I would say, the physical <coughs> physical layer. Yeah, if your whole application is on one machine, it doesn't matter, you know, how many retries and circuit breakers you have. If that machine fails, your application uh, will be done. So the first idea is to do bulk heading at physical layer, maybe deploy your application to two availability zones on Amazon yeah, or even two regions. Now the, the next level is the host system. So rather than having your application on one host, one VM, maybe it split those into multiple VMs. Because if the VM dies, it doesn't matter uh, or, or, or what's in it. The third one is the process layer. So rather than having one monolithic uh, process, have multiple processes, standalone processes, because if one of the processes dies because of high CPU or, or, or there's no memory, it won't spread into other processes. And the fourth level is the one that actually developers have to be concerned, and that is using multiple threads and thread pools for different kind of operations. Because if one thread gets blocked, yeah, you don't want the whole application to freeze, you want the operations to be performed with different threads. But that Hystrix implementation is using a separate thread pool thread for each call. Because if that call is blocking, it's not going to block the whole Hystrix library. And for, for, for this fourth level, we um, you can do that basically in camel uh, using um, all, all these patterns support multi-threading. So whenever you are using multi-card or CPM splitter, you can make it multi-threaded and give it a thread pool and to implement the bulk heading. You can also use the circuit breaker ERP. Uh, another one to be cautious is when you do asynchronous error handling, by default, all the asynchronous error handling in camel uh, will be using the same uh, camel thread pool. Yeah? So it's possible that only one of your, sorry, only one of your uh, error handlers to consume all the threads and the others may just uh, basically block. Yeah. So we, so far we have seen what? 
some of the happy path scenarios, a number of failure scenarios, and I just want to touch a little bit on the scalability. Uh, uh, now, there are two ways to scale here, horizontal and vertical. Vertical is when you add more resources to your system. I would say when you apply the vertical scalability principle into the application, that is more or less like the tuning of the application. And for, for that, in camel, you, you can do a number of things here. Yeah. If you want to basically get the best out of your camel rules or the available resources, you can, you can tune it. The first thing to check is, say, the endpoint. Camel is the only memory, and it's very rarely the bottleneck. It usually it integrates systems, so the, usually the bottlenecks are the other systems. And one thing you can do is to configure the different uh, options in the endpoint. Yeah, if, for example, if you are using messaging, you can configure all kinds of messaging buffers, socket buffers. Yeah. If you are using, for example, doing database writes, rather than doing one write per message, you can use an aggregator and do a batch insert in one transaction. Uh, if you are using templates, you can enable caching. So there are many things you can do at the endpoint level. I mean, it's like the first thing to check. Then there are a number of camel components which will allow you to do multi-threading inside the camel routes. Yeah. And the, the state that the VM and GMS, all, all these mm, endpoints support concurrent consumers. Uh, even the data, uh, data format choices will affect the performance of the camel routes. Yeah. If, for example, uh, you have a large XML payload and you do content-based routing, that, that will have a, a performance impact. And, and you can do also some, I would say, micro-optimizations. They probably won't help you less with, to improve the performance. You could in, in disable JMX or disable the original, uh, the original message, message history, all kind of stuff that sometimes help to reduce the resource usage. Mm. You can make the stuff that shut down faster. You should always uh, tune the JDM, the networking and, and the operating system. Uh, and I've put all the, uh, these considerations a while back in the blog post. If you're more interested in performance tuning, come on and check that. Mm. So mm, that, that was like the ideas for tuning and uh, vertical scaling. In the horizontal scaling, rather than adding more resources to one uh, system, you basically have multiple systems. And you can do the same at the application level. You can start multiple instances of your, let's say, camel routes. In this case, I have uh, basically started three instances of this route. Yeah, and this route is writing to a database. And we have multiple instances of request dispatcher just to avoid single point of failure. Yeah, and all these camel routes talk to some kind of target system. And to do that, you know, before doing it, actually, you have to, um, I would say, consider a number of things. Uh, the first one is your services have to be stateless if you want to horizontally scale them. If they are stateful, it becomes quite difficult to call that. Uh, but even if your services are stateless, you have to be cautious because some of the camel EIP implementations are stateful. Yeah? Like the load balancer, system breaker, the sequence or sampler or dropper, they all have mm, internal states. Uh, some of the others, like the important consumer and the aggregator, also have states that, that can be externalized to a database. Mm. So, what, what can happen with this state is if you have two camera routes with some kind of load balancer in front of them, it is possible that one of the circuit breakers is in open state and the other one is in closed state for a while. So it is possible that you may have this kind of differences. Uh, the other thing is consider the way you dispatch messages to the multiple instances. If you're, if you're using HTTP, a lot of balancers will do that. If you use messaging, it's again fine, the message worker will do that. But if your camera routes are consuming from a folder, you have to consider the file blocking issues that may happen. So the request dispatching mechanism is something to consider. If you use messaging uh, and you start multiple instances, you will lose the message order. Uh, to deal with that, I've given you a number of functionalities that can help you. And uh, 
the last thing is about single-point services. So some camel routes, like the one based on timer and triggering and backdrops, <coughs> if you start multiple instances of those, you will have that trigger uh, uh, multiple times. And to avoid that, you need a way to make this camel route single-point. So you still want multiple instances, maybe for high availability, but you want only one of them to be active and the other one to be passing and waiting. So if we just have a look at what we cover so far, mm -hmm. different patterns do help to achieve different kind of uh, non-functional requirements. I would say one pattern doesn't strictly belong to one NFR, it usually contributes to a number of places. The moment we cover the one which are a bit startable and you see the, some more which we don't have time at the moment, but these are just a few of the different patterns I've been using. Mm -hmm. And I just want just to give an idea how we think these patterns are changing uh, at the moment. Mm -hmm. But to answer that, we just have to see what is happening right now in, uh, in our industry. I mean, the way we develop software has been changing from waterfall to agile and now to DevOps. The way we architect applications uh, is changing, let's say, from SOA to microservices. The way we deploy is becoming more and more containers rather than work files and application servers. And yeah, everyone is on the cloud already. Mm. And all these things are drivers to, to implement different kinds of patterns. Like the canonical data model, which is one of the patterns in the SOA world, is now being replaced by bounded context, as you say. So you have uh, a data model per service rather than a protocol or enterprise. So rather than having edge components, uh, having multiple endpoints for one service, you end up having multiple standalone services. Rather than reusing code, microservices favors basically duplication rather than having any kind of dependency between your services. Yeah, rather than reconfiguring your applications, now you have immutable applications which you, I would say, configure less, or the way you configure is not to uh, class loading, but you redeploy the whole application. The way to achieve single-point services is not anymore inside the JVM. Yeah, instead, you delegate that to something like Kubernetes, which starts single instance of your process. Mm -hmm. Even the backdrops, rather than using things like Quartz to do backdropping, where you have one JVM which runs all the time, you can use um, Kubernetes jobs, which will start your process, let's say, at midnight, and your process does one job and it's shut down. So instead of doing things in the JVM, they are delegated more and more to the platform. And, and these patterns are already, say, used. Uh, now I have a question for you. So um, just to, I have a copy of my book with me, the hard copy. And if someone knows when is the birthday of Camel or when the very first comic to Camel was done by James Chapman. You can say it was March 2007, but anyone with the date? It was my note as it was to be. 19, I think. Okay. Probably 19. Uh, okay, yeah, that, that is correct. Now she can take the That doesn't care if everyone else does. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Somebody else. But I guess it's for the only one who knows that. Yeah. 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 You say he commented what? 2200 lines in one comment. <laughs> Initial check in time of this. We are now nine years old. Mm. Mm. And yeah, I guess you know where the camel URL is. This is where the book is sold from the impact. Do <coughs> mm. you have any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, considering the following context and the high number of messages that come in, mm -hmm. uh, they have a header value, and based on this value, they have to be uh, processed in a serial manner. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, other values can be uh, processed parallelly. So is there an out-of-the-box way in Camel to generate queues on the fly based on this header value to assure that what has to be processed serially is processed? Mm -hmm. Is routed there and in their own yeah. queue, and after they all have finished the queue, is probably destroyed because we don't need it anymore. 
So first, uh, not camel, but active MQ allows you to create queues on the fly. The moment you send a message to a non-existent queue, it will be created. Yeah, that, that might be the way. Uh, the other thing is you can use an um, in-memory queue in camel, something like said, uh, mm -hmm. just temporarily to accumulate messages. But that will be so is there problem. like a router in camel that could help me achieve this to route the messages based on the header value? Yeah, so you yeah. first have to use something called content-based router to spread the messages to different routes. And in this route, you send them to active MQ. And the queue name can be in the header. You know, it doesn't have to be pre-created. So it can be created on the fly. You just have to think how you would delete the queues afterwards if you have to clean them up. But, but yeah, it's all there. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, everyone.